it on, so if you can't hear me, it's not my fault. Um, or I'll just shout about her. Maybe we'll do some of both. So let's talk about, my talk is beyond more, beyond programmable logic. It's intended to be, uh, to be a bit of an exciting title, to, to really bring people in in the morning, uh, have them brave the, the tram, uh, the packed tram, which I did this morning, uh, which seems to get busier every morning. Um, so, but I do want to talk about two, there are two parts of this. Uh, the, there's the beyond more part which is the, 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 the Moore's Law thing. We all heard about that, so we'll talk about that. Uh, and that's the first part, what's happening in semiconductor technology? What's going on with Moore's Law? So we're in this business, we know what Moore's Law is. Uh, yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk about that. Uh, gee, isn't it always just going on as usual? Uh, we'll talk about more than more. Can we do better than what Moore's Law is giving us? And there's this thing that I, Call less than more because you know Moore's law just isn't as isn't as wonderful as it used to be, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, about how that affects us. What are we really getting, and what are we not getting? The next thing I'm going to talk about is what's happening in science because I could talk all I want about the technology and how that's going to make the future different than the present, uh, and but you really don't know if I believe it. <coughs> unless I'm doing something about it. Okay. So from the Zyling's perspective, what do we think is going on with the technology? How is that progressing? And then what are we doing? Okay. And so that's a, these are related uh, somewhat causally, and we're looking into the future too and saying, what's that like? What are we, how do we, and, and Alan Kay's words, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So we're going to try to create the future uh, we're looking a little bit ahead of their technology. And in that, in, in that uh, uh, vein, I can talk about, uh, you know, maybe not too explicitly, but in my talk, uh, you should pick up what's going to happen next. Uh, what did, you know, I'm going to talk about the progression in the past, what we're doing now. Okay, we're going to put those, we're going to connect a couple of dots, and we're going to say, I'm going to leave that each up to you individually, uh, rather than biasing you too much. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, really smart people here, and uh, maybe you should be creating the future the way you envision it. So let's launch into this. Big question comes up all the time. Is Moore's Law ending? I have been in the semiconductor business a long time. And uh, it's pretty much always the case. Uh, we look at the process technology, and the next couple of generations, it's pretty clear uh, what the, what's going to happen. We have a pretty good idea of the solutions to the problems coming on, but farther in the future, it gets kind of hazy. Well, I've got to tell you, you know, with all the, there's some people who are claiming the end of Moore's Law, and that's just sort of a cottage industry. Everybody does that, and everybody's been wrong so far. But I've got to tell you, right now, now look at the technology, the next two generations are pretty clear. It only gets hazy two generations out. So, this is business as usual. It's more law ending. Uh, it always looks difficult a little bit farther out in the future. But is it really different now? We think about the uh, physically. Uh, what are the limits that we're facing? We're getting to the point where we're trying to make transistors that are at atomic scale. Something's got to give there. It can't just go on forever. And it's well known that exponentials cannot go on forever. This is an example. This is not Moore's Law. That's not what this graph is. What is this graph? This is the number of miles of railroad track in the United States between 1820 and 1890. <laughs> this exponential did not continue. And we know that because if it had continued, there would be no place in the United States to be more than five paces from a railroad track. That may be true in Oslo, but it's not true in the United States. So, exponentials end eventually. 
So we take that and we think, okay, well, is it now? How would we know? How could we predict if this is really ending? What would be the signs? Uh, you know, what, how, how can we predict that? Let's, let's just look at some things. First of all, Moore's Law says the number of transistors doubles every couple of years. It does say nothing about how much power they consume. It doesn't say about how fast they run. It doesn't say how much they cost. Just that you get twice as many of them. Okay? Well, let's start looking at these things. What about how much power are we consuming? Well, this is, you know, nothing new here. We're all very familiar with this. Power increases, power density increases, uh, yes, we've got a problem. And this is not a brand new problem, this is a problem that's been facing the industry for some time. Great. Uh, so what do we do about this as an industry? Let's not talk about FPGAs, I don't mean talking, talking too much about semiconductor a little bit, but generally what happens? Multicore. Yeah. What happens? Look, it's too, it, it consumes too much power to run these 5, 6 gigahertz processors. Let's just make 3 gigahertz processors, or 2.5, and, and just make twice as many of them. Or 4 times, or 6 times, just make, let's just make a lot of them, and we'll go multi-core. And from, the, from an FPGA vendor's point of view, this was great for me, right? Because I said, that's what I've been doing all along. Look at all these little bitty cores. We have all hundreds of thousands of cores, and uh, we're way ahead of this. So, those of us in the programmable logic industry, we were very pleased with ourselves that we are ahead of this, and we know something that those guys are just starting to learn. And then when they start to program these things, they'll come around. Okay, but it did work. You get processors with more cores in them, and you get more cycles per second. Um, you don't just get them all on the same machine. Let that work. Second problem. Now, this blue line is Moore's, Moore's Law line. So, so, yes, we have an exponential growth in the number of transistors, and that's wonderful. We like that. Um, so I can compute a lot inside this package. But the problem I have is I can't get the data in or out. And a few of us have kind of run into this problem. And so we look at how the data is being moved. What do we have to move the data? And we look at the bottom line, this is the number of pins on the package. And that's growing, but that's growing pretty slow. Uh, and we have the number of bumps inside the package. This is how the die actually connects to the package substrate. And that's growing, but also it's growing better but still not growing at that same rate. And so we look at this, this is a problem, because sooner or later, we're going to have so much compute inside this, inside this chip, we're not going to be able to feed it. We don't have enough pins to feed it. Well, that's actually the wrong question. That's not the number of pins. That's not the problem. The problem is bandwidth. It's the bits per second. Okay, let's solve that problem. And as an industry, we solve, we address that problem. How do we do that? Faster data. We're going to have high-speed transceivers, and we're going to really pump the data in and out. We don't actually need all those pins. And everything worked out fine. We solved this problem. And we can go on. No, we can't go on. Why can't we go on? What did I just say? How did we solve the compute problem? We keep the frequency fixed, and we go to more execution units. How did we solve the I.O. problem? We keep the number of units fixed, and we increase the clock rate. This can't go on. That's, we have these two problems in there, and they're opposed. What can we do about that? Talk about that a little bit later. Next problem. This is all wonderful. We have these great chips. Now we, get it. we have, this, we have this Moore's Law line going very rapidly still. Um, and we have this problem of people, uh, how, how do we design these things? How much, how, how much logic can an individual create in order to build these devices? And so this has been going on for quite some time, and, and uh, you know, our, our ability to design is growing sl more slowly, much more slowly, than our ability to manufacture. So what happens? 
What happens is, I, we have the ability to produce very large chips. We don't have the ability to fill them up with logic. Do they get built? Or don't they? What do we do with all those extra transistors? Well, here's another time when the FPGA guy said, this is a great time. I know what to do with those transistors. I'm going to make programmable logic instead of ordinary logic, and we'll waste a few of them to make it easier to program. So that's a weak. Well, that works, but this exponential keeps going. And it gets more, still more difficult. And so it's an industry, and it, and it continues. This will, some of this data a little, little old, but still, in 2011, the ITRS roadmap, it, their italics say this is the issue. So, as an industry, what have we done about this? As an industry, what have we done? No, oh, it's too much to do for one person. Let's enable a lot of people to work on it and find one. Um, oh, it's too much to, too much work to. To, uh, to fill this chip with brand new logic? Well, we'll just be able to integrate blocks of logic, IP from other places. We'll improve the level, the, the level of design. Can we make it easier to design, abstract it a little bit farther, and get more leverage out of that? That's working too. And the final one is, is SOC platforms. If When the designs are this big, it's not the same as when I got into the FPGA business. When I got into the FPGA business, all we could put into one chip was a few thousand gates. It wasn't a whole thing. It was a part of a thing. And now, these chips are so big, what we design fits in there and rattles around, and there's a lot of other stuff that has to go in there to, fill, to build the whole system. And we're talking about this a little bit later, too. Not just about logic. You've got to do the whole problem. Because the whole problem fits in the chip. Now, it's important in, uh, in semiconductor technology, we have the technology roadmap for semiconductors. This is a slide that comes from IMEC and saying, what does that future really look like? How are we going to do this? How are we going to build those transitions? What do they look like? And so there's a progression. What we're, going, what we're seeing now is looking at just at the transistors here. What do we build? So we have a couple of generations of high K metal gate transistors, and then probably a few generations of thin fets. Uh, and those are, you, know, as you look in the future, look, these are great because you look at, oh, I got photomicrographs. I feel much more comfortable looking in the future with photomicrographs. But then a little bit farther out, uh, you know, around seven nanometers, we see this little, this little cartoon here. It's not really photomicrograph, but some of that. I think if we wrap the if we wrap the gate completely, we'll get a better transistor in there, right? But obviously, since nobody has photographed one, nobody has built one, so it's not quite there yet. And then you go a little bit farther out, and somebody's doing well. You know, I think if we do use graphene, then I might my my, uh, my, uh, my waveform simulation seem to show that's probably a good thing. Uh, yeah, so it gets a little hazy out there a couple, uh, a few generations out. Same problem we've been experiencing all along in the semiconductor industry. And of course, this, this scary yellow bar says novel materials. Doesn't say which ones. So a little bit of a concern. But we have a roadmap, and that's good. It's good to have a roadmap, as long as the roadmap is taking you and showing you someplace where you want to go. Right. If the roadmap says you get to terra incognita, to get someplace that you just don't want to be anyway, that would be bad. That would be bad. Where does our roadmap take us? If I build ships, if we use this technology, what do we really get? Remembering the constraints on Moore's law, remembering what it doesn't tell us. One of the things that that, that happens here is, with these new technologies, variability. Can you control this technology enough to predict what's coming out the other end? And so, there's a debate here. Then that's are relatively new. So far, there's only one company making them. Um, and there's a concern that, yeah, they vary a lot. It's, uh, uh, they may not all be the same size. Uh, what happens to my system? Do I, do I, can I even predict the performance of that? And so there's a, there's a lot of concern. Can I predict the performance? But longer term, 
can I predict the, the reliability of a lifetime? Do these thin fins burn out quickly? So there's maybe just these questions about these new technologies. Um, and I should say, uh, to throw in a dose of, of, uh, of experience, uh, this is not unique to FinTech. So, so concerns about the quality of the technology have been around with every new materials introduction and every new technology. Just seems, seems like a greater concern now than it did before. But this is the one that's got to be more of a concern. So this is cost. And it's important to remember Moore's law is not a technology law. Moore's law is an economic law. What Moore's law says is every two years, we make enough money on our semiconductors to pay for the equipment to make them twice as good. So it's about money. And because it's about money, one of the things that we've always assumed we got and you know, one of the things we usually did get from Moore's Law, besides we used to get power, we used to get speed and all that, trade some of the way. We always knew we get twice as many transistors, but the cost of the silicon would be the same, so each transistor would be half the cost of the one that gets generated. So IBS is a, is a business consulting company, and they poll this whole supply, the semiconductor supply chain. And to figure out how much are all, how much is this silicon going to cost? What's the wafer price? What's the yield expected? What, all these questions. And they came up with this model. And they looked at the last few years and said, you know, uh, we weren't getting half. We're getting maybe 25% drop, maybe 30% drop. Uh, but the really scary part was here. 28 nanometers seemed to be at the bottom. And 20 nanometer, not only do we not get any cost savings in our transistors? Each transistor is going to cost a little bit more. That's got to be scary. If transistors don't get cheaper, then Moore's Law says we get twice as many of them. We just got to pay twice as much to get them. That's not the Moore's Law we expect it. Just like it was not the Moore's Law we expected that no longer gave us power savings or no longer doubled our performance. It's still the Moore's Law. You're still getting twice as many transistors. They're just more expensive. What that says, as engineers, uh, we've got to do a little bit more work. I mean, the, the easy days of of sitting back and using the new process technology and looking like a genius just because we did the same thing we did two years ago, those days are over. We're going to have to work to get the glory for building systems twice as big and twice as capable and twice as fast. Now, personally, I think this, because Moore's Law is an economic law, I don't think that can actually happen. But what can happen at first, if the, if the actual cost of the transition doesn't come down, it will delay the cost of technology. And so instead of getting it every two years, it might be three or four. It might take three or four years for TSMC to recoup the investment at 20 nanometer or 14 nanometer. And that, that will slow down our entire industry. Okay, so this is bringing me into the summary of the, of the first part, Moore's Law today. What is it? We get more transistors. Moore's Law is still intact. Uh, by the letter of the law, everything is fine. Uh, we must create performance for power savings. We know that. We've been doing that. Uh, we're doing a process design. We've been doing it in, in circuits. We've been doing that architecturally. We've observed a slow growth of I.O., making bandwidth really critical. Critical and power intense as we ramped up the frequency on the I.O. So that's where we're seeing a huge increase in the power. 
Gentiles. We're seeing this flowing of the, the, the actual realized cause of reduction. Which you know. So part of it is lithography limitations. Uh, the, I didn't mention before, but it's, you know, we're still using 193 nanometer light to make 20 nanometer transistors. The physicists, the physicists look at them and shake their head, you can't do that. And the engineers look at them, again, as close as I want, I can, uh, we, can make, we can make crummy images and still get pretty fair transistors. So we're doing that. Um, and then thin threads are going to we'll quantize the size. All this drives up the, the, the cost of the flock, it makes the process more complex. Just more, more greater cost, more expensive, more expensive for us, harder to, to drive down the price. Process complexity and limited suppliers. I hinted at it a bit ago. Um, <clears throat> Moore's law being an economic law uh, uses economic incentives to push it along. If there is competition among suppliers, there is economic incentive for them to push this rapidly. In the last decade, there's been a considerable reduction in the number of suppliers of leading edge process technology. And so the game is Intel and TSMC and then roulette wheel after that. We don't know. So there are limited suppliers that can supply the new technology. So their economic incentive is uh, pushed a little bit more towards supporting pricing. But we still get more transistors. And so, how do we use those transistors to build the right things? If really the game is we get more transistors and they're cheaper and they're faster and they're lower power, then the game is do more of the same. Because it's going to be a whole lot better and you don't have to think too much. But if you actually have to pay for all that. It becomes more important to do the right thing. What's the right thing? What is violence doing for the right thing? Now we enter the part where I've stolen some slides from Market. And you may have noticed that uh, that they get better pictures on them now instead of just graphs. <laughs> So despite all the concern about do we get faster, do we get lower power, do we get lower cost with new technology node, we're committed to it because we get more transistors. And we can do great things with the additional transistors. We're also not content to allow Moore's Law to be the only technology driver we have. We're driving technology in 3D. Talk a little bit about that too. And we're using the transistors we get to build different things. And in particular, we're building processors, mixed signal. We're doing more kinds of things for the same reasons that we've talked about as I went through. And I'll, hit, and I'll touch on those as, as they go a little bit. So, now I put up my Moore's Law side capacity of looking up. These are Xilinx large devices through history. The red dot, that is the, the latest 3D device, that's why it's red. Uh, and it's a little, you can see a little bit above the line, but this being in uh, plotted, plotted on a log scale, it's hard to get anything off the line on a log scale. Uh, but yeah, we can, it does tick up the capacity numbers we can achieve. Performance. Performance is still looking up, although not quite as up. Still getting, we're still getting performance gains, and we expect performance gains of new technologies, and we are getting performance gains out of being a little more clever. Better circuits, better architectures. This is, these are system clock frequencies of standardized blocks inside there. So there's a, a block of, of compiled blocks that we've tried in the world. 
number of different architectures. Um, despite all the hand wringing about power and consumption, uh, power consumption is looking up too. The, the power consumed per function, per operation, continues to go down. And it's a combination of two parts. It's capacitance, things, the transistors shrink, the capacitance goes down. And the voltage has come down. Now lately the voltage hasn't come down an awful lot. And so power, the, 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 the energy trend, the power consumption, hasn't improved as rapidly as it had back in the good old days. But we're still getting performance improvements out of that, our energy improvements out of that. So what's the new technology look like? I'm going to look at this pretty quickly. This is an Intel slide of a technology that uh, TSMC deployed in 28 nanometer, the high gate metal gate. And in, this is TSC, TSMC employed this in their HPL, their high performance, low power process, which is a hybrid uh, high performance and power. Uh, the advantage we, we got out of this was it cost us about 1% performance loss for about a 30% improvement in power consumption numbers. And so what that allows us to do, of course, if you're power constrained, that basically gives you a 29% improvement in, in what you can produce. So big improvement for a couple of process generations by a, a, an improved transistor structure. What we're able to deploy on this, and this is again, you know, all, the, all the really great slides with the bubbles on them, these are, these are from marketing. And I'm not going to go through the whole slide. If you really want to read it, you can go right ahead. But I want to point out a few things. And one of them is one you, that the slide's intended to point out, and that is the big yellow bubble at the top. And this is the, this is the chest beating number that says, you know, look at this. Uh, we can make a really huge FPGA with this technology. But that's not, for me, that's not what's really interesting about this. What's really interesting about this is not the big number at the top. It's this Artex 7 350K number. Why is that interesting? Because you draw a line across the Vertex 5, and you see Artex is our, Artex is our, our low cost, low power family. And what it's saying is, today in this generation, we can build a 350,000 logic cell device it's as big as the biggest Vertex 5 we could possibly produce. As big as what, you know, and, and charge whatever we wanted to for, right? Just two generations ago. So, is, this, is, this is now the kind of a low cost thing, a low power thing. Is Artex 9 going to have 2 million launch cell points? This is what Moore's Law really gives us. <laughs> It gives us these huge changes, not just in what we can do, you know, the marvelous brand new thing we can do, which is pretty good, but the ordinary everyday thing we can do can be very exciting. But let's talk a little bit about that big device because it's the more than more device. The stack silicon technology is Inside the packs, I had that slide with the with the, the pins and how the pins were drawn. Inside the package are the, the package bumps, but in between die inside the package are these micro bumps. They're, they're even smaller and we get a lot more of them. So we ease that constraint about the number of units to do communication. And so we can cut down the frequency and we can reduce the power consumption of communicating between these dots. So this is the 2000 has built a four small die. Each is individually tested, assembled, micro bumps to a silicon substrate, through silicon because through the silicon substrate for getting the, the actual packet signals in and out and power and ground. That silicon substrate is a, it's a, it's a 65 nanometer. There are four wiring layers on it. So one way to think about it is you have four extra wiring layers that we use to wire up the pre-tested <coughs> And lay them out side by side. Why do you do them side by side? Why don't you stack them vertically? Because the wires would be shorter if you stack them vertically. You don't stack them vertically because then the ones in the middle would overheat. And so what's driving this technology uh, is thermal issue. 
What do we get out of this? By the, the, the I.O. structures that we have to communicate between DIE, these are not package pin structures. They're special engineered for this. Vastly improved power. So the, so the communication power is much, much, much better. Um, and we get, the, the squint at this, and you get to say, well, instead of making one huge guy with, with maybe we're way out on the edge of the yield curve, we make four smaller die that each yield very nicely and assemble them. So we actually get a cost advantage. So what am I getting out of this stack silicon? Well, I get a cost advantage out of it. I can make really big things cheaper. Actually, what it means is I can make really big things. It doesn't matter if they're too expensive for anybody to buy or if they yield so low that we don't actually yield any, so we don't get any. So this allows very large capacity devices. So this is the, 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 the summary. What do we, inside that package, all the things I've talked about, and uh, 6.8 billion transistors. So it's a, a very large capacity thing. Well, maybe that'll be... Maybe that'll be the low-cost device in two generations. We don't know. But that's not the end of the story. Because it really fun from having to have the same process technology do high-speed serial I.O. and low-power logic. Right? This is what was constraining us in the, in the I.O. structures in previous generations. I had to have the same technology do my transceivers that are running at multiple big orders. That did running the FPGA, that all I want to do is, is is save power and then we'll get a lot of time. So here we split that out. So I have, you have different die. We have the, the same FPGA based die we're stacking there. And we have a transceiver die that's built on a transceiver technology, a high performance technology. It runs at high speed and burns, and burns less power than if we had tried to do it in the low, in the low power process. And we don't have to, we don't have to compromise the FPGA process for that. So, very exciting. It's, it's qualitatively different than things we could do before. We could mix these technologies in a package and not compromise the process. So, we get two different processes. But, and it doesn't, it doesn't need to stop. Where do we go? Inside these packages. What's inside? How high can we make the stack? How do we get the heat out? Who, what chip is going to be on top and what's going to be in the middle? So, <coughs> these are the design issues that we face. Today, there is no, uh, there's no EDA environment to do this reliably, uh, except for the one you know, we've put together. So, the question is, what if I want to, you know, if, you know, if a customer comes to us and says, we want to build our own stack. Because we have, you know, we, we like the idea, we like the, these, these FPGA pieces, and we like these, these transceivers, and we want to put, our, put in our own special <laughs> nanomechanical gadget. Uh, and the answer today is no. No, just as certainly as can I go to TSMC and say, you know, I like your technology, but I have this ferro thing I want to put in the middle of it. You can't do it because it messes up the process. And as an industry, we're not sure how to do that. So today, uh, you should find that this technology is being used by semiconductor vendors such as Xilinx to produce a thing that looks like a semiconductor, rather than as by system vendors to build, to assemble something out of a library of component parts that they might buy of known good value on the internet. So that may change, but today that's not there. The supply chain isn't there. So, what do we get? We break the exponential cost of large die, and we break through this, this, this problem with, I'm trying to go wide with number of execution units, but high frequency with my IO. I'll get my IO across in, 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 inside of that. Let me get back to this productivity gap thing. I talked about the systems issues. Some system integration is required. Why? Because inside the package, it's the whole thing. Once you've got a whole system in there, you've got to solve the whole problem. It's not just, can I build a whole bunch of gates of logic? I've got to build a whole bunch of gates of logic, and it has to interface the right interfaces, because I'm talking to external components. I've got, I've, I've got a processor in this, probably running a TCP IP stack. I've got all non volatile memory in here. 
I've got all the things that I have to build a system out of. That's not just a piece of logic. That's on a, that's just a small subset of my of my system, which is what programmable logic has been for a long time. These are programmable systems. Certainly have seen over the years the uh, increase in the number of FPGAs with microprocessors in them. Whether they're hardened microprocessors or soft processors built out of that. Basically, this is showing that trend. What are these systems? It's not just logic. It's logic and process computer processing. It's sequencing. Okay. So, what's an answer? Well, instead of thinking of ourselves as just being programmable logic, let's think about programmable systems and put them together. And so this is where Zinc comes from. Zinc is the, the design links, programmable logic, and processor. Now, I said that from an FPGA vendor-centric point of view, and I have to uh, admit my own biases. Uh, so I, I think of it as programmable logic, and then we put a processor on it, and that's how the, our first attempts were done. It was uh, a power PC, but that's not as important as the fact that it was the FPGA-centric vision of how you do this. Well, I've got a, my, what is a processor? Ah, it's a block you drop inside, and you connect all the pins of the programmable logic and build whatever you want. That's what we did. Uh, I explained the, the zinc as part of the other, the other way around. What if I took a microprocessor? What if I took a dual-core RMI? And I, and I put that in my, in, in, on, my, on my chip, and I wanted to put some, some programmable logic with it. Yeah, I would have the ARM, and I'd have this entire subsystem with all the peripherals, and I'd have the, all the memories it needs, and, and it can run like a computer. I can, I can boot up an operating system, just run it there. Oh, yeah, and if I address certain places, I would get to, a, to, get to a programmable logic and can offload instructions and other interesting computations. Yes, you could explain it that way. But it's actually a little more interesting than that. Because it's it's the ARM processor, yeah, and there's programmable logic, yeah, and there's all the peripherals, yeah, and there are all the all the busing and interfacing as one would expect from an SOC, you know, more like a programmable system on chip. Why? Because the technology is able to implement complete systems, and so if you're trying to solve a complete problem, rather than have uh, an ARM chip here, an FPGA here, and a, an analog an analog digital converter. And uh, another external memory, yeah, we, we, we can include these all in one. Uh, the other part of this was when I, whenever I talked about this, people were, were very concerned that designers would want to own the entire tool chain, not only for pro programmable logic, but also for embedded processing. And, uh, and the result was no, it's, it's sort of a, a measure of maturity, I guess. That, uh, that at Zylons we decided, no, we're not going to try to own and develop all of it. We'll just partner with everybody and, and interface to the right places for, the, for, the, for that code. So where does this zinc thing fit in the universe? It's a family of devices. And if you want to see it, you have to go out to the university and check it out. And, or, or go to the class that was held on, on Monday and Tuesday. If it's too late for that. Um, but, uh, and there's a talk later on today, so you check that too. But where does Zinc fit in this, this whole universe? Uh, and interestingly, Zinc family encompasses the same number of gates of architecture. So it's the, the, the processor version of the biggest thing you could produce in vertex time. The next part of this is fixed signal. Okay, I mentioned that. Yeah, we want to, the world is analog. How do we interface with that? So there's enough of enough analog signaling going on, and these systems that we're in are, have that, that, those interfaces required. So, analog mix signal in the device as well. Now this is not, you know, world class, highest performance analog mix signal. What this is, is the stuff everybody needs. It's industrial control. Uh, you know, this is, this is, this is 12, 14 bits kind of range of the kind of negative. A lot of signal, a lot of inputs. Another thing we get out of it is it monitors our internal signals. So we can monitor our own power consumption, we can monitor our own, our own, our own we know our own voltage, we know our own temperature. Which 
enables us to build interesting systems internally, but also uh, is a, a key component in some of our security features. We can, we can, the device can know when it's under attack. So, this gives us higher performance. If, by integrating all these components, we get much lower power. Things that had been separate devices and we had to have, get a signal to the board to get to that. Either separate devices of dissimilar types or just multiple FPGAs. We're taking advantage of those additional transistors to put things in one package and reduce power consumption. So, programmable components, we have systems, logic we've done forever, microprocessors, programmable I.O., analog fixed signal, it's all programmable, and that's where the, the tagline at the bottom comes from. It's all this programmable stuff. We're doing it all now. So, the tools to do that. Earlier I mentioned IP as in, and reuse IP as an important part of this. Uh, the, 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 the new 7 series architecture is the same architecture across from the Arctic, Kintex, and Vertex family. So it's, it's uh, the, the IP ports. If you're doing standardized IP, you have to meet standardized interface. How many times have I seen standardized IP, but it's a proprietary interface? So it's much work to interface to the interface as it would be to build it itself. So that's got to that's got to be standardized as well. Um, the bottom, which uh, if the Zilinx marketing department has anything to say about it, there'll be a lot about. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest improvements there is the strike runtime. Uh, it's not going to get down from hours to minutes, but it will get down to uh, most of a day to a couple of hours for, for the kinds of things we do. Uh, interfacing, I'll leave that all up to you to, to explore. Uh, because the part I really like about, I would like to talk about here, is the, the auto ESL component of the auto. One of, one of the problems with HDL is we have, it requires too much specification. It requires expressing the register transfer on clock image. And what we get, when, when I look at the, you know, the, at, the, at the C translation from auto ESL, yes, we get uh, a syntax that's more comfortable to a lot of people. But we get a semantics that eliminates some of the constraints. And so the tool can insert more pipelining. The tool can insert more execution units. And make some of those decisions because they're left unexpressed in the language. It gives more flexibility to the tool. Uh, and that's, uh, 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 so, and even that may be a secondary advantage. The big advantage is a little bubble at the bottom that says, what, how, much is this, how long is your simulation time? By having a single representation that runs as, a, as your C code and is the specification of your functionality, that, can be, that specification can be used for verification. And verification tends to consume a lot of time. And so this can, can bring, and you know, we're worried about compile times being days long, we certainly have seen verification times being weeks long. And so this is a, a, a significant improvement to that. So all these all these product changes, improvements that I've talked about, there's a there's a timeline. And we and we tend to express this stuff in the immediacy and just and we you know right now, right? What do we have right now? Isn't this nice stuff? Uh, but they all have long histories. And, and actually, when I, when I was preparing for this talk, I thought, you know, maybe what I should do is I should take one thing, uh, maybe uh, the stack silicon, which I know pretty well, and go back and trace it out of it, it, its entire history. Because this shows the stack silicon going back to 2005, but I know it goes back to 2001. So there's all these technologies have long histories. Either they may be internally developed, People working on this them themselves, uh, seeded projects, funded academic research, funded companies. Uh, 
in, in, in that position. So there's this long history that goes into, into developing the technology that we can deliver today. And what for me, what's interesting is though we, you know, we see this timeline that goes back eight years, and we think of what's going on in the technology today. What are what are people doing today? The new, the new companies that are that are out there, some interesting new developments in the labs, and saying, you know, in 2020, what are those? What are we gonna? What are we gonna stand up here and say, look at this wild, radical technology that's really really impressive, enabling to change the way we can deliver our products. How is that? We can, can we trace that all the way back to 2012? And, and interesting glimmer of an idea in a project. And that's exciting for me. So, the technology evolution from just being logic to being system integration, all programmable. If we look at the road ahead, uh, programmable logic isn't programmable logic anymore. Uh, I don't expect a change in the title of the conference, but, you know. uh, but it's more than that. And, and I, and I want to highlight that, especially for this community, because if this community, this, the, the leading edge thinkers, are, if this community is being held back, are thinking about the, uh, the technology or the, the deliverable as being this piece of logic, or being a component in the system, or being a small part of the solution, then you're going to be missing the big picture. The big picture is, it's the whole solution. You've got to, it, engineers, right? In order to produce something that someone can use, you must solve the whole problem. So, what is, it, what is the whole problem that we have to solve? Let's not be limited by our history of looking at all these small pieces of it. On the technology side, we are, we're still gaining benefit from Moore's Law. And those transistors, you know, they may get more expensive, uh, they may be a little less capable than we wished, but that's just engineering too. That's just what engineers are here for, to do great things with the technology that comes at them, to make that, to make better products, make better outcomes out from what we've, what we've got. Uh, and if the technology that we're given, if it's the transistor scaling, and if it's not what we like, if we're not getting cost improvement from transistors, well, we'll just stack silicon. We have cost improvement from, from stacking them rather than trying to make big monolithic devices. So, the future is still bright. We are still looking up. And the future is all programmable. That's my talk.
So, but I don't, I don't have a quick answer to that. The standard answers we have in the, in the industry today, uh, power management, uh, system level power management. So, uh, turning off fractions of the die you know, that are not being used, that sort of thing. Uh, if, you, if you believe that is the solution, the only solution you're going to apply, uh, then we look out about two or three generations and we see that 80% of the die will be shut off. If I have 80% of my die shut off, why is it there? <laughs> uh, and maybe this is the opportunity, the, the, the programmable or the reconfigurable opportunity, right? If 80% is shut off, why not have a device that's just one, one fifth the size and reprogram it as needed? So uh, I don't know that answer. Uh, uh, hoping either. <laughs> but the, you're right. The, 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 uh, uh, the energy story is, is it, it is still the limiting factor in how much competition we can get done at, at, across the industry. Uh, Just stretching? Everybody wants some coffee? They want to Whoever, whoever speaks last. Uh, 
uh, Steve. So you are saying, I like this, uh, the stack selection thing is pretty cool, but do you think that at some point we have to go through D? Because you're only spreading out over a surface, and then at some point that gets too big. Uh, we have to go through D eventually. Deep in my heart, yes. Uh, there is, uh, but I don't know how, uh, how we're going to solve those intermediate problems. Uh, uh, how, do, how, do you, how do you get the heat out of the middle? You know, parents probably have a both. We got this heat density problem, and that slide was just, you know, watts per square centimeter. You know, watts per cubic centimeter is going to be a, you know, that's a whole new dimension, right? <laughs> so yes, and so there's a there's some marvelous new technology that wasn't on the roadmap slide that says how do we get the heat out of the middle? And I, I, I don't know how we get the heat out of the middle. I get Copper plugs that go in the middle of this big heat out. Uh, something has to happen because otherwise we just can't do it. And until that thing happens, uh, we won't be able to do it. Uh, these, these technologies, and that, one, of the tech, one of the questions that, that I get sometimes here about, you know, this stacking stuff, this isn't new. You know, gee, when I was in graduate school, they were talking about stacking stuff, and we had these companies, and how can you claim this is new? And the truth is that uh, the idea isn't new, but the, but the way it's being done, the materials, the, the, the through silicon via etching, the micro pumps, these are new. And why is that important? Because when I was in graduate school and people were doing this, they yielded approximately zero of them. They got one of them to work. And it was, you know, you know they, they got, took a photo of it. And, and it was very, very expensive technology. It was something that only could be applied to the highest performance computers or the most secret military applications. Um, and what's different now is the, ma the, the manufacturing and the supply chain has come around to the point where this is something that can be done for commercial use and can be done for us here. And, and so, you know, how do we do 3D? We need a technology that gets the heat out of the middle and is still cost effective to manufacture. And we don't have one of those yet. Okay, you see, uh, I think we will uh, we have to end the uh, now, but thank you so much again. It was a terrific pleasure having you and great. Thank you so much.